Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the section of God's word that we'll be looking at today, it was our gospel lesson found in John chapter 1. Uh, we'll hear again just the opening few verses of that Bible text uh, where it says, uh, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, and he came only as a witness to the light. And this is God's word. So dear fellow believers, uh, Ben Franklin once said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Being prepared is important if we want to achieve success at just about anything in life, isn't it? As something as simple as going to cut down your own Christmas tree to have in your living room, you need to be prepared for that. How do you prepare? Well, you got to go to the Forest Service office to get a permit, otherwise you're going to be guilty of tree poaching. You have to, when you go out to get the tree, you have to make sure you have some kind of a tool to, you know, cut that tree down, something like a saw or something like that, to make sure that you can take that tree down and bring it home with you. You have to make sure that you have a way to safely get that tree back to your home, you know, whether it's a pickup truck, a trailer, or, or the roof of your car and stuff to tie it down. You have to make sure that you give yourself enough daylight to, to get there to cut it down, to strap it onto your car, and to do that before the sun sets. There's a lot of preparing that goes into just something as simple as getting a Christmas tree. And so how would that go if you didn't prepare? You'd get out there and wouldn't be able to cut the tree down. <laughs> you'd get out there, you'd cut the tree down and realize you have no way to get it back home again. Or you get it on top of your car, nothing to tie it down with, or it's dark before you can do any of that. Fail to do any of those st steps and you're... Christmas tree hunt, so to speak, will not be successful. Even worse, it could potentially end in disaster. The tree falls off on the highway, that's going to be a nasty thing to have to deal with. So yeah, there is, pre preparation is important no matter what area of life we are in. And so as we think about preparation, again, we're in the season of Advent. Our focus is on preparing for Jesus to come. Last Sunday, we were introduced to John the Baptist, the man sent by God to do just that, to prepare people for Jesus to come. And so today, we prepare for Jesus by listening closely to John the Baptist's message. Now, among the people who went out to John the Baptist and followed him as a disciple was John, the writer of this gospel account. You see, John, the gospel writer, was a disciple of John the Baptist before John, the gospel writer, became a disciple of Jesus. I know, keep track of all of that for a minute. What we see, though, today is John, the gospel writer's firsthand account of John the Baptist's preaching and how the people in general responded to it. And so he introduces John the Baptist by saying, there came a man who was sent from God, his name was John. And this John had a simple job. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, concerning Jesus, so that through him all might believe. And so John's job was simply to be a witness. What's the job of a witness? It's not to speculate, not to guess. The job of a witness is to just tell what they know. Uh, and so what did John know? Well, he knew that the Savior was coming. He knew that the Savior would rescue the world from, from sin and death and its effects. And he knew that the Savior would soon begin his work. And he knew that the way for a person to be prepared for the Savior was by repenting, turning away from sin, turning away from self-salvation. And so that's what he said about proclaiming. He began his ministry out in the wilderness uh, near the Jordan River. And as he began that ministry, we have to understand that among the people of Israel, this was a time of, of great expectation among the common people. You see, they were hoping for and waiting for this promised deliverer from God, the Messiah, to come. And, and what had happened over the past couple hundred years was that there were a handful of people who had come and had claimed to be that promised deliverer. And yet every single one of those men ultimately failed. They, they, they died. So the religious leaders of the day were more than a little bit skeptical of some new preacher appearing out in the wilderness and drawing a big following. And so they sent this delegation out to John to learn more. They asked him a question, who are you? It was a loaded question. I think without a doubt they knew that he was John, the son of Zechariah, the priest. You know, They were a pretty well-connected family in Jerusalem, but they wanted to know more. They wanted to know what authority John claimed for himself as he preached in the wilderness. Or rather, they, they wanted to know, John, who do you claim to be as you come out here and preach? 
And so John answered. It says, he didn't fail to confess, but confessed freely. I'm not the Messiah. Even though people were flocking to him in droves, perhaps uh, wanting or even hoping that he was the promised Savior, that he was the Messiah, John in no way was ashamed to say, that's not me. I am not the Messiah. I am not the one that you've been waiting for and looking for and hoping for. Now in that situation, it would have been very easy for John to try and uh, claim some glory and honor for himself. He could have tried to make himself look more important in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of those religious leaders, uh, and in the eyes of the common people. But what we see here is that John the Baptist, he did not seek his own personal honor. He did not seek his own personal glory, but he knew the role that he'd been given. He was not the light. He was sent only as a witness to the light. And so he carried out that role by not claiming glory and honor for himself, by letting, but by letting all the glory and honor be only for Jesus. You see, you and I often face a temptation that is similar to the one that John faced here. You see, God has given each one of us a role, a role that is in some ways similar to John the Baptist. You see, God has not asked me, nor has he asked any of you to save the world or even to save one person from sin and death. He hasn't asked us to do that. Nor has God asked you, nor has he asked me to heal the world of its diseases and its problems and its plagues. Instead, what has he asked us to do? Simply to serve in the various places where he has called us or where he has put us in life. To serve as friends, as co-workers, as mentors, as parents, as spouses, as neighbors, as church members, and more. And, and while what we do in those callings is important and meaningful, we need to guard against having that Messiah complex while we serve in those various roles. What I mean by that is we have a temptation and a tendency to, to overestimate our own importance to think that there is no way that anything in those circles where God has put us could possibly go well unless I am heavily involved in those activities. Or we have a temptation to think that, well, I need to accomplish more than is humanly possible in my role as a parent or in my role as a, an employee or whatever those roles are uh, because it has to get done and it has to be this way. Or we think that if I were to depart this or that role that everything would fall apart as soon as I walked out the door. What are we doing when we think that way? In effect, what we're doing is taking glory and honor for ourselves rather than letting that glory and honor be for God. We forget what our role is. You know, we're not the light, we're not the Messiah, we're just the witness, we're just here to serve. We're not the Messiah, Jesus is. But we all have times when we try to claim glory and honor for ourselves rather than letting that glory and honor be only for him. But yet the one that we are not, we are not the Messiah, that's the one that John proclaimed. You see, John got people ready for Jesus and pointed to Jesus because Jesus was the one who was tasked with saving the world from sin. And that's what Jesus had come to do. He had come to save the world from all of its sin, including the times when we claimed glory and honor for ourselves that belongs to him. And so now with John focusing us on Jesus, we can prepare for his coming by knowing our role. Yeah, he's called us to serve in our various stations, in our various places where he's put us in life. Each one of us, he's given the task of serving in those places to the best of our ability and our words and actions. So we can serve him and we can give him the glory. You know, know our role. That's the first thing we learn from John the Baptist's message. But there's something more important to know than just knowing our role. And we see that as we carry this account even further. As we said earlier, John's role was to prepare the way for Jesus by being a witness, by giving testimony about him. And so he answered well when he said, I'm not the Messiah. But that answer wasn't good enough for that delegation sent to him from Jerusalem. They wanted to know more. And so they kept coming at him with questions. So John, you're not the Messiah then. Then are you Elijah? You see, they asked that because of that verse we read from Malachi earlier that talked about God sending Elijah before the Messiah would come. And so they were expecting that in some way that old prophet Elijah would, would come back again. Well, John says, I'm not a reincarnate Elijah. So no, that's not me. Well, then they asked him again, well, if you're not Elijah, are you the prophet? Well, they were referring to something Moses had said just before he died. And he said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me. And again, John says no. And so this delegation from Jerusalem seems to get a little frustrated with his answers or, or maybe lack thereof. They become impatient saying, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? I mean, can you hear the frustration bubbling over in their voices? The only reason they'd come out to hear John the Baptist was not to actually listen to what he had to say, 
but it was just to be able to report back to their superiors what they'd learned about him. And so far, they had learned more about who John the Baptist isn't than who he actually was. This time, though, John gives them a more descriptive answer. Using words from Isaiah, he says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now that reply should have gotten their attention. While he did not claim to be the Messiah, did not claim to be Elijah nor the prophet, he did claim to be this voice. This voice that called out to prepare the way for the Messiah, prepare the way for the Lord to come. He quotes directly from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, a verse that the, that the rabbis had consistently read and consistently interpreted with messianic implications, that this voice's job was to prepare the way for the Lord, prepare the way for the Messiah to come. But they seemed to pay no mind to what he just said. In fact, some of this delegation who were part of the Pharisees just kept on asking him questions. And so, Finally, John speaks. He, he says to them, among you stands one you do not know. And this one you do not know, he's the one that you should be listening to. He's the one that you should be looking for. He was talking about Jesus, but they didn't know him. And while they, yes, yeah, someday in the future would definitely come to be able to recognize Jesus, you know, pull his face out of a crowd, thing like that, every inclination is given that they never actually came to know Jesus as who he really was the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. We have to ask the question, why? Why didn't they come to know Jesus as who he really was? Well, they were waiting for it. They were looking for a Messiah. Why didn't they immediately ask John, all right, so you're sent to prepare the way for someone? Who is he? Whose way are you here to prepare for? And why didn't they ask him those questions? It seems that though they wanted a Messiah, they just didn't really want the Messiah that John was sent to proclaim. And so Jesus, you know, the Messiah, remained unknown to them. Though Jesus, the Savior, stood among them, they didn't know him, they didn't recognize him, and it stayed that way. See, this is the key to being prepared for Jesus, is knowing him, knowing him as he really is, knowing him as your Savior. And there's two big ways, I think, that we in America look to Jesus as something that he's not. Uh, the first one is when we look to Jesus primarily and solely as an example, an example of what a good life is. Uh, this expression was really popular probably 20 years ago now, but the WWJD, you know, what would Jesus do? Maybe you had the bracelets, things like that. Um, maybe you've even heard it said, you know, the world would be such a better place if we could all just act a little more like Jesus. And true, right? If we could all show a little more kindness, a little more love, a little more compassion, the world would be a better place. But, but when we look to Jesus only as an example, what do we do? We take Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, and we take God's word and, and we turn it into kind of a, a heaven-sent self-help manual. But see, Jesus came to save us from sin not to show us how to be nice to one another. And so the fact is that unless we go to the Bible to see Jesus and his saving work for us, even our best acts, you know, even our most devout Bible reading can just become part of our own self-improvement and self-salvation plan. So if we read the Bible only asking what would Jesus do, instead of first asking what has Jesus done, we can so easily miss out on that good news that Jesus came to bring, miss out on that good news that alone sets us free. And so looking to Jesus only, or even primarily as an example, that's one way that Jesus can stand among us as someone we don't know. But also among those who have been taught from little on that we're saved, we're right with God, not because of our good life, not because of how closely we mirror Jesus, but entirely by God's grace and, and, and God's saving work in Christ, there's another way that we can look to Jesus for something that he's not. And that's when we look to Jesus as somebody who kind of says your sin's not a big deal. I was sent to forgive, so don't worry about your sin. You know, it's not really a matter of what I do. I can do whatever I want. Jesus is going to forgive it anyway. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. It doesn't matter if I, if I know that it's wrong. I can do it and Jesus will forgive me. Well, that's looking to Jesus as a license. A license to live however you want. A license really to make yourself your own boss rather than to follow him. Well, if Jesus, again, is just an example, or if Jesus is a license to live however we please, then... And he's standing among you as someone you don't know today, just like he did for the delegation of Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. But there's one thing that stands out to me about John's words regarding those who were looking for a different Messiah, those who didn't know Jesus. Though they weren't looking for Jesus, though it seems they weren't even really interested in knowing him as their savior from sin, where was Jesus? He was still there. He was still standing among them. He was right there, right them 
right there for them to see, right there for them to know. You see, so great was Jesus' desire that they know him as he really is, that he wasn't too proud to stand among these people who didn't really want to know him for who he is. And the same is true for you and me today. You see, among us today stands the Savior. He's right here for us today uh, in his word. And in that word, he's ready, willing, and eager to be known by us. And in that word, he tells us that, that even if we've looked to him as something other than what he really is, if we've looked to him as an example or as a license, we're forgiven. Not because God wishes it away, but because Jesus uh, lived perfectly in our place, died on a cross under the curse of our sin, and rose again from the grave. You see, if this is the Jesus you know, the Jesus who's your savior, then you can be thankful because knowing Jesus in that way is really a gift that not enough people in this world have. The reality is that the Bible is one long story of, of God meeting our rebellion with his rescue, our sin with his salvation, our failure with his favor, our guilt with his grace, and our badness with his goodness. So we can look to Jesus as our savior and we can know him as that savior but he, because he forgives all of our sin. And so then how has John the Baptist helped us to prepare for Jesus' coming? He's reminded us that, that while we wait, we can know our role. You know, we're not the light. Our job isn't to save the world or fix the world. Our job is just to serve in that role and let him have the glory. But more importantly, he's reminded us to know Jesus, not for who we want him to be, not for who we think he is, but to know Jesus as he really is, the Son of God and our Savior. And so with this knowledge, uh, let us be prepared for Jesus' coming as we serve and wait for the day he comes. Amen.